Thank you for all the Kaho colleagues, um, um, especially Dr. Akarwar, Lalu, um, Sabar Mata. Um, you know, it's a uh, privilege to share um, the platform with all of you. Um, um, my job is uh, uh, just uh, about the experiences from outside, and uh, we have got a very decorated speaker, uh, uh, many, Dr. Manish Kohli. So just a couple of words uh, before um, I um, introduce uh, Dr. Manish Kohli. I think, um, you know, we, in the public health uh, area, we have uh, already um, proved that um, automation is very important. The COVID pandemic has put uh, uh, such a great strain on the global public health uh, ecosystem and uh, which was already plagued by health worker shortages and lack of uh, digitalization. Even though digitalization came a little late in our field, the uh, healthcare field, but now it is catching up uh, in a larger scale and uh, with a faster pace. And uh, it was clear across the world, including uh, developed countries, that the technology uh, intervention in the form of public health automation was uh, essential for survival uh, during these testing times. Um, so, uh, in fact, if we look at the vaccine formation also, uh, the vaccine was, uh, you know, maybe it would have taken several years and several billion dollars uh, were saved, uh, you know, and um, even uh, the administrative aspect or the consulting aspect, uh, we had a, an almost 6,000% uh, uh, growth in telemedicine. Um, and uh, in the UK, the the healthcare system is almost getting collapsed uh, uh, because of the lack of workers and um, and uh, enormous uh, strain because people were resigning from the uh, from the uh, national health service system and uh, and so um, it was a a, a real uh, example for all the whole world that uh, NHS is the one to follow but um, now. Uh, everyone is in doubt whether that is the ideal model or not. Insurance sector also, there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, pre-authorization, claim submission, etc. cetera, uh, got very well um, automated. And uh, so uh, a survival of uh, these testing times happened because um, of the automation and the vaccine formation um, uh, is, was a, a classical example. So we would like to really learn much more about it uh, from and hear about it uh, from Dr. Manish Kohli. And um, Manish Kohli um, is a CEO uh, and founder Beyond Horizon Health Consulting and Advisory, which uh, advises clients on healthcare, startups, and delivery initiatives. Dr. Kohli advises domestic and global startups that aims to transform Health and uh, uh, health and care uh, through novel technologies in the area of patient engagement, uh, digital therapeutics, etc. Additionally, he is a senior advisor to Albright uh, Stonebridge Group and serves uh, uh, on the technical advisory panel um, Joint Commission International. Um, Kohli is the immediate past chairman of the board of uh, directors of. Uh, Health Information and Management System uh, Society, HIMSS. Uh, Dr. Kohli served as a director of global programs, uh, Harvard Medical International and Chief Medical Information Officer at leading health system, including Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi and Advocate uh, um, uh, Aurora Health and John Hopkins. So I think uh, such a decorated position and such a uh, uh, depth in this area. I think uh, we are all um, eager to hear from you. Uh, and um, I am very happy to invite you, Dr. Manish Kodi. And uh, over to you, sir. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Shahdullah. Uh, truly honored and delighted to be part of this uh, distinguished panel today. What an amazing conference so far. Uh, my congratulations to the entire organizing team for such an amazing uh, cast of uh, speakers today. 
Uh, let me share my screen here. Thank you again. Uh, it's truly an honor uh, to be a part of this uh, uh, conference uh, today. Uh, as I've uh, witnessed uh, uh, digital health globally over the last uh, 20, 25 years of my career, uh, there have been a number of uh, trends uh, that have become apparent. And what I've witnessed in the last three years is how quickly the world has come together to really begin to look at how we deliver uh, healthcare better. Um, frankly speaking, I think uh, globally we underdelivered uh, to our patients. Uh, there was a lot of gaps that became exposed overnight, but it was remarkable to see how quickly countries like India came together to really create innovative solutions. And, and as, as I've heard the talks today and I've uh, engaged in conversation with health systems leaders uh, within India, the maturity of dialogue has really progressed. And I think uh, if there's a silver lining to COVID, it is that, that we are having these discussions today that are going to lead to a better health system for India. <clears throat> but let's not forget that even before COVID, health systems, health systems globally were underperforming. Uh, safety and quality continued to be a significant challenge. And as health systems became more digitized, especially in the West, we began to get data on how much harm we were causing due to medical errors in health systems. We're also spending a whole lot of money in healthcare, uh, especially countries like the US. Uh, globally, we spend about 10% of our GDP on, on healthcare. And there's a lot of inefficiency that's attributed throughout uh, the delivery of healthcare. And there's an opportunity uh, for us to really begin to look at how we deliver care and how do we actually do our business a little bit better. I can tell you that no other industry would survive with this level of waste uh, within its ecosystem. And workforce shortages uh, have been amplified during uh, COVID, uh, not just in healthcare, but in every industry. People are looking to do things differently and they're making choices based upon what's important to them. We also have an actual shortage of health professionals, uh, uh, including doctors and nurses. <clears throat> and this shortage is much more acute in lower and middle, middle income countries. The net result is that we have 3 billion people around the world who lack access to a health professional. So despite the spend in healthcare, we're still leaving uh, almost half of the world's population without access to healthcare. And India certainly is, is uh, making some ambitious strides in, in bridging that gap and, and, and improving the inequities that exist in healthcare. I think the other thing uh, that is really important to note is that as health systems have gotten digitized, especially in the US, we have witnessed an explosion of data. I like to see this, uh, call this a data tsunami that all of a sudden we have created a very magnificent data capture systems that have created an explosion of data for frontline uh, doctors and nurses. And that is essentially causing us to drown in information while we starve for wisdom. And as we begin to look at how we emerge from that, it is really important to understand that the role analytics play in the delivery of care and in man making this data more manageable. And not only within healthcare, uh, within the four walls of healthcare, there's a lot of data being generated uh, from outside sources. And if we look at social determinants of health, these sources are going to be very rich and valuable sources of insights that will impact how care is delivered, delivered in the future. <clears throat> but fundamentally, as we look at how do we move forward from COVID and how do we begin to redesign healthcare? It's clear that it's not going to be just by building more hospitals. It's really going to be using a different approach. And previous speakers have alluded to, uh, to these trends. But as I look at this, there are five major axes that we really need to look at. Improving safety and quality, improving access to care, really becoming cost conscious of uh, uh, care delivery, and then looking at how we address the challenges of workforce that exist in our ecosystem today. But the bottom line is we have to serve our patients and our families better. And I can tell you that um, almost every one of us um, has witnessed personally or through uh, a friend or a relative, immense tragedy during COVID. But even 
without COVID, I can tell you from personal experience, having uh, built a uh, leading stroke center outside of India to have one of my family members not to get the right care, at least initially, was very heartbreaking. And really, I think that's, that's really what all of us uh, are attempting to achieve as we march forward in digitizing healthcare and really improving the delivery of care. So what is digital transformation? And I'm absolutely delighted to hear the conversation around interoperability, infrastructure and standards and access to data because that is really where the money is. Uh, digitization and digital transformation is not simply building <laughs> the front end and really not addressing the, the, the back end. And I think this is where India is leading some of the other geographies, where now the conversation is building on core components so that innovation can happen on top of core infrastructure and, inter and interoperability. That we look at uh, uh, how do we build <clears throat> a digital health ecosystem. Uh, the way I like to think about it is really the fundamental piece, uh, foundation layer is governance and workforce. Uh, <clears throat> And this is something I think where we need more conversation on in the, in the Indian ecosystem. The health systems leaders that I've spoken with have all echoed that we need more people. We need people with more digital skills and we need to develop training programs. There needs to be governance around data stewardship, privacy and security. And these are all things that are quite achievable. Interoperability and democratization of data is, is uh, uh, the theme uh, so far, and I think there's been a lot of good, good work that's happening at all levels. But as I alluded earlier, uh, acquiring data, acquiring data in a usable format is an important achievement, but really looking at how do we deal with gleaning insights that allow better decision-making at every level of the health, healthcare enterprise. And I think this leads to building digital capa capacity over time and then achieving population health and wellness. So what are the digital health system achieved? Really, we begin by mobilizing data from multiple sources within healthcare and outside of healthcare. And as data begins to flow, you really begin to uh, 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 leverage analytics to improve health and wellness and really connect digital, digitally connect individuals to self-manage health and wellness. We move from interoperability to prescriptive analytics to person-enabled health and well-being. One of the um, areas, uh, one of the key uh, tools that I've seen that have delivered great results are the maturity model that the Health Information and Management System Society uh, has, has created. These have been in use for almost 20 years now, and they provide aspirational roadmaps and they convey a vision of transformation. And the key features are that they are very healthcare specific and vendor and solution agnostic. They're globally applicable. In fact, almost 800 million patient lives are now impacted by a health system that have uh, gone, undergone a health, uh, a, a HIMS MRAM assessment. What is the profile of a digitally mature stage seven organization? They are all driven by outcomes and use data, data to improve outcomes related to efficiencies, cost, clinical care, and quality and safety. All of them are paperless or nearly paperless. Data is easily available and accessible. And there is a culture of continuous improvement, which I know CAHO greatly, greatly promotes through collaboration. There's strong leadership and executive championship at each level. And there are clinicians who are engaged in the process of uh, using technology and changing technology and evolving technology. The, these are the results of organizations that have undergone HIMSS uh, MRAM assessments. As you see, the, the, the greater the maturity level, the better are the performance scores of these in, uh, institutions. When we look at quality metrics, stage seven organizations deliver excellent results. And when we look at safety uh, ratings, 62.6% uh, of stage seven organizations received an A rating from LeapFrog hospital safety uh, group. <clears throat> Financial performance is very important to note. Organizations as they mature digitally tend to demonstrate greater operating margins. And furthermore, bond rating agencies tend to view organizations that are at stage seven favorably. And, and you can imagine the reasons because these organizations perform better financially as well as operationally in delivering care. 
So switching to um, uh, some of my experiences uh, that have shown except, uh, success at the ground level. So I'll talk about Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, which I had the privilege of being part of. And the goal of uh, this uh, project was to replicate the first multi-specialty hospital asset in North America. And our mandate was very clear that we want to build a hospital that delivers the same level of quality in the Middle East as is delivered in the US. They did not want to have a building with a Western hospital name, but really wanted to have the DNA brought to a different part of the world. Really to cr create a cultivatable and sustainable healthcare system that is somewhat of a disruptor in the market. And also to begin to support the development of the next generation of local workforce. So how do we uh, uh, how do we achieve this? These are uh, it was a very large facility, almost uh, four and a half million square foot of the building area. But when we opened, we were fully digital, and within a year of opening, we were uh, achieved we achieved some significant um, uh, uh, successes, including the HIMSS stage seven six, um, uh, certification. So we began with the end in mind, and and really what it meant was really looking at what does great care look like. And one example of this building a, uh, a stroke program, which was certified by the Emirate of Abu Dhabi as the, national, as the Emirate Wide uh, Stroke Center. Cleveland Clinic had taken painstaking uh, uh, efforts to define what great stroke care looks like. And as that uh, care was implemented and, and digitized and digitally enabled, we saw the results in two key metrics. One is <clears throat> the PHQ-9 level, you see then increase from 1.52% improvement to almost 9% after the stroke care path was implemented. This is in a period of three years. Similarly, when we looked at the quality of life index, uh, we saw significant, statistically significant improvement in the quality of life index because of the implementation and digitization of the stroke, stroke care pathway. And, and this uh, comes as no surprise because what are care pathways? They are sophisticated multi-layer tools that enable delivery of value-based care. They tie together outcomes, processes, costs, and patient experience using you know, uh, a, a complex uh, mix of components in, in the technology that include workflows and navigators and flow sheets and so forth. So beginning with what great care looks like, Cleveland Clinic has created almost 80 care guides around uh, uh, each disease state, articulating clinically what great care looks like and then systematically, these have been digitized uh, and, and uh, put into clinical practice. The next example I'd like to share, or the other uh, piece I want to share with you is uh, one of the comments that was made by a speaker earlier is, how do we actually begin to scale this kind of uh, quality to uh, uh, tier two, tier three primary care settings? And one of the things that Cleveland Clinic has done really well is created the quality consortium where the technology platform that the Cleveland Clinic uses, it has been extended to hospitals and, and primary care clinics that choose to be part of the network. What that does is it gives uh, the outlying uh, uh, institutions and clinics the ability to have access to a pretty mature platform at a, at a uh, nominal cost, but it also gives Cleveland Clinic uh, 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 a referral channel that builds over time, but the clear winner in this becomes the patient because all of a sudden, because of the use of a mature uh, integrated digital platform, the quality of care that's delivered to the patient using this platform is higher than baseline. The next example I'd like to share is, is the Parkville Precinct in Melbourne, Australia. This is a group of four hospitals, the Royal Melbourne Hospital, the Children's Hospital, the Women's Hospital, and the Peter Mac Cancer Hospital. I had the privilege of being the assessor for, for this hospital as they went on their stage six and stage seven journey. And there's some common themes here. They also began with uh, success, uh, uh, with the end result in mind. And what uh, Parkville Precinct really focused on is complex care coordination. How did, they, how did they leverage technology to really begin to manage very complex uh, patient uh, cases? And what they showed was that once they uh, implemented technology and went through the assessments, they were able to actually demonstrate reduction in mortality and uh, risk-adjusted mortality at their uh, facilities. The overall EMR satisfaction in Royal Children's Hospital was extremely high according to ARCH 
um, uh, class uh, Arch Collaborative, which was uh, an initiative done by class. Now, one thing that's different between uh, Australia and the U.S., even though uh, 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 Parkville Precinct is using uh, the same EMR system that Cleveland Clinic is using, the burden of documentation in Australia is much, much less because of regulations. So it's a single pair, pair system, and physicians really use this uh, technology not to document uh, for largely billing purposes, but really for complex care coordination. And, and this really uh, shifts how uh, uh, the uh, physician and frontline folks uh, perceive uh, the, uh, the uh, experience in the use of technology. So the key su success factors really at Parkville were framing the digitization as a clinical program rather than an IT program. And I think this is a common theme that I've seen throughout uh, all the organizations I've engaged with, that this really has to be owned by clinicians. Technology should serve patient care rather than patient uh, uh, care being served by technology. <clears throat> um, second, strong leadership and engagement. Uh, this is, uh, again, a very strong and common theme across, uh, uh, across the world. And at uh, uh, Parkville Precinct, this was quite, quite apparent during the uh, assessment. Uh, there was an upfront investment in implementation planning. So people, processes, and technology and change management. And I think this is something really important. While it's tempting to jump headfirst into digitizing, uh, taking a step back and kind of thinking about what are we trying to achieve and what is the change that the organization must go through to achieve the outcomes. Change is hard in healthcare and, and doctors and nurses are under a lot of pressure and they're oftentimes uh, set in their practices. So to be able to manage change in, in a manner that is uh, going to be palatable and each organization would be unique is very important. And then uh, uh, Parkville Precinct uh, chose to do a big bang approach. Uh, and I've seen big bang approach uh, work equally well as a phase implementation. And this is again, part of the planning process that one has to uh, uh, engage in. And then using the HIMSS uh, uh, validation criteria as goal, goal post in planning, but also report cards for further improvement. The challenges, uh, uh, again, tend to be very common across uh, the world, uh, uh, maintaining organizational focus because uh, technology is one of those things, it's an ongoing uh, uh, investment. And, and if, if technology strategy is aligned with operating strategy, it makes it much easier for the organization to really think about what are we trying to achieve? What are the processes that need to be engineered and how can technology support that? Technology should not be an afterthought or a separate thought. So increasingly, we begin to see, uh, you know, the roles, for example, of chief operating officer and chief information officer beginning to merge because really there should be one strategy that's driving soup to nuts. And then often, uh, you know, uh, uh, as, as organizations begin to get more comfortable and more mature, uh, there is always uh, a demand from the end users, which is in a way a good thing because it shows engagement but in the ability for the uh, health information system team to make changes. And this is really where new models of creating a, a, a balance between supply and demand would be very important to consider, especially in a market like India. Then I'd like to just touch briefly on Johns Hopkins, which is where I started my career. And I led the digital transformation at Johns Hopkins. And it, again, this was driven by the leadership. Uh, there was a decision was made that we are going to transform our clinical practice. And this was in the early 2000s using technology. Remember back then the uh, EMR solutions were not as mature and, and the market was still on a learning cycle. But safety, uh, patient-centered care and improving quality were the core themes. And this was also the time when the Institute of Medicine in the U.S. had come out with a report which said the U.S. is harming, uh, in fact, 100,000 uh, patients or more are dying every year because of uh, the care that they receive uh, in the uh, U.S. health system. So we began uh, 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 a very methodical approach, but we use a phase approach in this institution. And, and the keys to success were communication and engagement of uh, uh, end users. At uh, every step of the uh, way, we engage uh, the physicians and the nurses in, in informing them, uh, in, in getting their input, and really driving towards something that we all collectively agree. 
leadership was very important and there were executive mandates on, on certain things to do and certain things uh, that uh, uh, would be acceptable. Training and support is very, very important in any kind of a, a digitization initiative. This is really where uh, I've seen a lot of organizations fail, uh, where uh, training and support gets shortchanged in, in, uh, uh, to make up for other uh, perhaps uh, delays uh, in, in a project. And then in the US where, uh, uh, at least at Johns Hopkins, where you know, the payment structure is around RVUs, uh, 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 the organization actually uh, uh, set aside a four week period where uh, RVUs for physicians were protected as they were uh, undergoing change. But here's an important thing, uh, really uh, leveraging early successes uh, is important. So uh, in the early 2000s, uh, uh, when a uh, recall uh, would be announced for a medication, the process was largely manual. It would take you know, several weeks uh, sometimes to identify and notify the patient. Because we were uh, digitally enabled, we were able to notify a patient within one to three days of a medication being recalled. And this resonated well uh, with the physician. The other thing is uh, really talking about carrots and sticks, is that the organization mandated that every physician had to have current allergy data in the electronic medical system. Just one data, but that becomes proxy for a bigger change that naturally happens. And as you see from the data here, uh, before the executive mandate that the allergy data had to be uh, in the system, uh, only about 40% of patients had allergy data in the system. But once the mandate was announced, you see the rapid increase almost up to 95% of patients who had allergy data. So what was the carrot uh, and what was the stick here? So a small percentage of physician compensation at Johns Hopkins is tied to their quality performance. And this uh, mandate was tied to the quality performance component for the physician compensation. And, and that was enough uh, to, uh, to have the physician staff uh, uh, take this uh, much more seriously than if this was not uh, part of a mandate or tied to compensation. And I think in India, there are those uh, possibilities as well, both at the you know, uh, payer level, but also at the individual level, where small things which are really critical, uh, for example, allergies or medication data in a system uh, are required to be current. And what one sees is that uh, once individuals begin to get comfortable in the system and they begin to see the value, they begin to uh, 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 adopt the system much, much more effectively and efficiently. The keys to success are nurses. In any healthcare enterprise, uh, uh, engaging nurses in a manner uh, that they are anchors of change is extremely, extremely important success. And I can tell you at Johns Hopkins, we engage our nurses really well to the tune that we were able to finish the project several months ahead of the schedule because nurses became very excited. They were engaged and oftentimes they end up becoming the trainers uh, for the doctors themselves. So ju just to conclude, uh, you know, uh, I am super, super thrilled about where India stands right now. The, the level of uh, conversation, the maturity, the opportunity ahead of us, it, it, it's, it's simply breathtaking. And, and one of the speakers said earlier uh, uh, that you know, India is on the world stage and this, she's absolutely right. India is on the world stage and the world is expecting India to leapfrog, much like India did with mobile telephones. 20 years ago, India did not say that we were going to build, build a land-based infrastructure we decided that we will actually move to mobile directly. And I think this is the opportunity that exists in healthcare and beginning with uh, foundational building blocks and, and really uh, creating innovating uh, ecosystems on top of that is, is going to be the secret to success. And I am truly delighted to, to witness the NBA part of this, uh, this journey. So thank you very much. Uh Thank you very much, Manish. I think it was a very informative talk. Uh, with, um, I think India is on the verge of uh, adopting many of these techniques. And even my hospital, I'm trying to do. But as you said, um, you know, the first thing is that we should uh, collectively decide with the staff, um, you know, this is the way to go and uh, their cooperation and the nursing engagement are uh, very important uh, to 
accomplish what what we want to accomplish. And um, you know, I had opportunity to uh, come to Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi, as well as in the U.S. And um, you know, and I know that uh, him's validation and uh, probably uh, digital, um, you know, setup there. And your experience fans out to uh, not only U.S. and DCC countries as well as Australia. And uh, finally, I think the operational advantage as well as the profitability increases. These are uh, really, um, you know, career for us uh, to go. And I don't think there is any debate on it that the only way we can go forward is uh, adapting the technology. So thank you very much. Mm-hmm.